occasions you have heard this parable that the Lord said about calling all these different people to the supper, which was done by a great person. And everybody, without exception, decided that they would not come on account of all the different activities that they had been involved with and were planning to be involved with. Sometimes I ask myself, if you were to be given that opportunity, what would you say was the greatest thing that you have in this world right now? What is the greatest thing? What is it when you think about it? Is the greatest, the most important, the one that is so vital for our life? And if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's not like these people who, look, who wanted to... Um, be excused on the count that one was married, another one wanted to do his business, another one wanted to check out his new Ferrari, and all these sorts of things. But rather, rather that it was the supper that the Lord had provided for us. In other words, Holy Communion. The church, the sacraments of the church which, which give us life. The sacraments that bring us from damnation into salvation. That is by far the greatest, the most important things in our life. And we are often so used to it that we take it very lightly. You know, we're in this small little chapel, there's not many of us here, and to say to somebody in the world that this is here is, here is performed right now, amongst a, a, a handful of people, the most greatest thing in the world, they would say that you are out of your mind. But in fact, that's the way it is. And in many chapels and cathedrals and churches throughout the world today, the same thing occurs. The greatest thing in the whole world, this supper of our Lord, is being performed right now and will be on this day for those who have faith in the truth. Often during conversations with others, particularly those who are not orthodox, um, Various arguments arise about which particular religion is the best one. Best one. And when you give all the arguments for orthodoxy, people will say to you, Oh, so you believe that orthodoxy is the best religion? Best one. You know, the best. Of course, that is politically so incorrect today because everybody now believes that no matter what religion you have, whether it's even voodoo, if you like. It's just on as good as any others. That is the wrong approach for us, for Orthodox Christians, because we are not seeking which one is the best, but which one is the truth. That's what we are seeking, the true one, the one that God gave to us, the one that has no error in it, that has no deceit in it, the one that does not lead you astray at all. That is the one that we follow, the one that is true. It first occurred when Christ stood before Pilate and Pilate questioned him on various ways and the Lord mentioned the word truth and Pilate was very confused and said, what is truth? What is, what is it? Stood there for a little while, got no answer and left. Well, he did get an answer, of course, because the truth was standing right there before him in the flesh, in the flesh and the blood the Supper of the Lord. There was Christ standing before him, the truth of all truth. And that's what we seek. That's why we come here. That's why during this um, liturgical period, we have Christ right here in the form of his body and blood in a mystical way that nobody can explain. Nobody can explain that particular mystery. But nevertheless, it happens. And that truth that we seek just think about it. If everybody in the whole world sought truth and tried to live according to truth, there'd be no lies, there'd be no deceits, there'd be no wrong actions, nobody would be trying to take advantage of anybody else, of hurting them in any way, or even doing um, damage to themselves. What a different world that would be. That's what we seek. That truth that is given by God to us that which is the most pleasing to God. 
And you could say that in our life as Christians, what we are trying to do in seeking this truth is actually trying to do God's will, that which is pleasing to Him. That is not an easy thing to do because we are in a fallen state. Our thoughts are not pure. Our emotions and feelings are not pure. Our desires are all wrong. We all seek things which are not profitable for us, even though we think that they are. And these things lead us away from truth. They lead us away from that which leads to salvation. And hence, through the church, we have a way of coming back through confession, repentance, getting back on our feet. But time and time again, there are blows to us from the left, from the right, from the top, from the bottom. Everywhere we are sort of um, cast down on the fact that we don't know what is God's will in our life. What is the truth that we should be following? And that is hurtful. The more you live a spiritual life, the more you'll see this happening in your own, in your own life. And the more you will realise the lamentable state that we are in, the dangerous state that we are in. And then if you look at the rest of the world, for those who do not know this and do not understand this, not only is it lamentable, but it's, it's all right, almost unbelievable. The things that people are doing today and have done in the past that do not know about this truth, who do the most abominable things, they have no... No conscience, no guilt about it, about what they are doing to themselves and to others as well. And it's no wonder that time and time again the Holy Father say to us that the world is being prepared for fire. It's being prepared for another destruction. Because things will get so bad that there will be no turning back. Just as there was in the time of Noah when the world had to be destroyed at that time by a flood in the next time by fire. And may we understand this seeking of truth in our life and stick to that, even though we might go off the path, come back again. Don't let those sorts of things that you uh, trip over make you despondent or make you to give up or anything like that. Because <clears throat> our Lord understands these things, the weaknesses that we have, the um, impossibilities that we have of seeing things as they really are takes a lot of struggle. And even holy people make mistakes, um, are not perfect in their, in their lives, because that truth is being um, hidden in many, many ways by our own fall our nature, our own passions, by the devil, by the desires, and by all sorts of things. So it's a big and great struggle in our life. That's what we call spiritual life. It's all about that. The thoughts, the feelings, the desires, the making of our lives such that it is pleasing to God. But what is pleasing to God? What is it? You see, that's what we have to know. That truth that will give us out of this horrid state that we find ourselves and into a, a state of great joy and happiness. This is, of course, reserved for the next world. Holy people get a taste of it. Perhaps some of you have had a taste of it in your life every now and then. But to be in that state continually is certainly a great struggle and it's very hard to do. Living in the world and being involved in all these sorts of things that we are involved in just to be alive. Again, the Lord understands this and does not um, condemn us for this as long as we repent of that, try to fix things up, and walk that righteous path. We are only a week or so away from the nativity of our Lord, which is another great truth. A great truth that here was given to us, the flesh and the blood of our Lord. Something for us to behold, something for us to use in these little chapels, the cathedrals, the churches that we have, that he came to us and actually gave himself over to us. That is a great truth. It's not a commemoration, it's not a symbol as many Christians now believe or, or something like that, but a great mystery. And through that great mystery we can achieve salvation and perhaps even save some around us, which is a great thing.
Next Sunday, on account of Nativity, we will not be having the liturgy, but on the Monday, straight after, which is the Nativity of our Lord, according to the church calendar, the 25th of December, which falls on the 7th of January, according to the secular calendar. So next week, and tell others, liturgy is on Monday. Um, I hope that most of you can come, that you're not working, maybe take that day off. But we'll be having the liturgy of St. Basil the Great on that um, glorious day when our Lord actually came and became one of us so that we can become like him.